Welcome to the Fine Cooking Podcast, the show for people who love to cook. I'm Kathy Kingsley, your host. Each episode, we'll be bringing the pages of Fine Cooking Magazine to life through our conversations with a mix of guests, our editors, contributors, cookbook authors, food writers, chefs, and bakers. We'll dive into a topic and then take time at the end of every show to answer some of your questions. On today's episode, we'll be talking about weekend brunch entertaining. Joining me today are editors Chris Hulk, Diana Andrews, and Sarah Breckenridge. But before we jump into our discussion about brunch, we like to kick off each show with a brief roundtable discussion of what we've cooked or eaten lately that we thought was interesting or exciting. So let's just hear from everybody here. Who wants to start? Chris. All right. Well, I, I know I've mentioned this before, but I've I, I've been doing this uh the long-term project of, of a bake the book for Abby Dodge's uh, The Everyday Baker. And over the winter, I started really focusing in on the yeast breads chapter, and I'm just finishing it up now. So, How many recipes was that? I think it's like 12 or I know it's 16 recipes. Wow. Okay. So been kind of fun just getting my hands back and, and working with yeastos, which I don't necessarily do all the time. And it's been fun exploring different kinds of doughs, like a, like a wet dough, like the ciabatta that she has in the, in the chapter in the book. And then kind of an, uh, an upgrade on her classic dinner rolls, which we love at my house. Rabbi has had a dinner roll recipe that Fine Cooking published a number of years ago that we lovingly know as the bread of death. <laughs> because it's like so loaded with like egg yolks and butter and <laughs> half and half. And when we all just laugh because we're like, should bread really have this much stuff in it? But they're so delicious that, you know, you just have to love them. So And the rolls. So they're not you're not eating like no. a lot unless you eat a lot of rolls. Unless but. you eat a lot of rolls, which we do. So, <laughs> so probably what was... doesn't even eat butter. <laughs> oh no, they oh. eat more oh, butter they okay. when they're warm. <laughs> yeah. What was the last thing you made from her book? What was um, the most recent? The last thing th- that I finished up the chapter with was her citrus spiced hot cross buns, oh, which was like kind of seasonally appropriate to finish it off mm. with that. And again, it was um, a variation on her dinner roll recipe. The other really good thing that's happened is I've got my roll shaping technique <laughs> down <laughs> pat. I know exactly how to make a beautiful, beautiful roll. So... It's a thing of beauty. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Do you brush them with butter? Yes. Oh, wh- how did I know that? Brush them with butter, <laughs> and then you slather them with butter. That's right. Mm. <laughs> how about you, Sarah? Um, I have been doing several renditions of a French onion soup burger. Um, my, my husband and I, a couple weeks ago, went to see Network on Broadway. Brian Cranston is amazing. <laughs> and um, we afterwards, we went to this restaurant row restaurant that like is so old school French. It's called Le Rivage, and his parents took him there as as a kid like you know very old school and they but they've kind of recently become instagram famous for this french onion soup burger they really Mm -hmm. so yeah we've been trying to replicate it at home it's um and it's just like a beef burger it's topped with melted i think we finally nailed it last night um it's topped with melted emmentaler and caramelized onions and um, like a, a bechamel with the grated gruyere or, you know, you melt some gruyere and emmentaler into the sauce as well. And yeah, and it's on a sandwich size English muffin. And it's okay. really that yummy, but it's very really good. rich. I mean, you don't need anything to pair it with except maybe a green salad or something. Sounds great. Yeah. That sounds incredible. I think, but I think once, you know, it's getting to be warmer weather, we're done with it. It's, yeah. it's very rich for, for spring and summer. Well, your kids eat that too? Um, yeah, they they do oh, like so it. Cool. I mean, you know, light on the onions. If they know there's onions on there, they're... <laughs> Just don't tell them. <laughs> exactly, yeah. There's nothing under that cheese. No, <laughs> they're caramelized anyway. It's like eating candy. Yeah. yeah, They're sweet, yeah. Everything's better with the caramelized onions. How about you, Diana? Well, I have been having a craving for ginger muffins, and my go-to is the Bridge Creek uh, g- Fresh Ginger Muffin. It's by Marion Cunningham from The Breakfast Book. And oh, I it, have that book. I wow. mean, I think everybody has that book. Goodie. It's a really old yeah. book. I got it as a gift uh, years and years ago. And I swear that's the best ginger muffin. She doesn't even bother having you peel the ginger. You're just really? chopping it up hmm. uh, with lemon zest. And she she just, you know, it's just so everything about how much, it is so How much ginger is in it? Uh, a couple of ounces of ginger. Oh, actually, quarter of a cup. 
chopped. Uh, chopped. It's about two ounces. I always like to throw a little bit more in. And um, and how many muffins does it make? Uh, 16. So it's a healthy amount. Although, you know, they're not that big. I mean, they don't really rise that much. But it doesn't matter because it's such a nice muffin to have uh, in the morning with coffee or tea or just a little snack. And she does something nice with the sugar. She puts it in a small food processor, or you can do this by hand too. And she actually uh, purees everything together with the lemon with the lemon zest. So the zest is really getting incorporated into some of the sugar, and it's not really clumping. So that's kind of a cool little technique. And then everything gets put into the pan, typical, you know. And now come these fabulous muffins. Really, really nice. What's any other spice in it? Not really. Just it's, the ginger? Yeah, mm. the ginger and sugar and lemon zest. And it's very simple, but real. And buttermilk. Of course, there's butter, too. Yeah. But so satisfying. I, I could see throwing a few other little spices in. Yeah, you could. During the winter, I'd say. You could tailor it to how you're feeling, I guess, that, that time. I might have to try those. I have to find that book. It's yeah. somewhere on my bookshelf. <laughs> It's old. It's, it's an a, old. It's really old. Yeah, it's an oldie yeah. but a goodie. She's got all breakfast stuff. All it's breakfast, fabulous. right? Mm-hmm. So I was just trying to think something I've cooked lately that I thought was interesting was I had a lot of miso in my refrigerator from something I made. You know, when you use miso, you always have a ton left over. <laughs> so I mixed it with some um, butter, and so I made sort of a, com- a miso compound butter, and I put a little honey in it and a, like a little vinegar in it, and then I rubbed it on some uh, chicken thighs and roasted it. Um, and it really added some really great flavor and you don't really even have to let it marinate. I just let it sit and, you know, while I was preparing. So I thought that was really interesting and I was going to try it also on some fish. I thought that would also be a good thing, right? Some, uh, Probably gives it a nice like a, brown. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the, For sure. I was thinking what kind of fish could I put it on? I guess anything. I mean, salmon, obviously, mm-hmm. but probably even, you probably even could use it on like cod or something like that, cod. right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Something that's a little firm. Mm-hmm. Mm, Cause I do have, still have miso leftovers. <laughs> And you will for quite some time. I know. I guess you just pop it in your freezer after a certain amount of time because you just can't use it all. But right. It does. And a little bit goes a long way. Yes, it does. Mm -hmm. Okay. So now we are going to get into our next topic, which is, you know, it's springtime now and um, Easter's coming up. Mother's Day is coming up. So a lot of entertaining and a lot of perhaps brunch entertaining on the weekends. So we thought we would talk about some easy tips and um, maybe some strategies for trying to keep your brunch time entertaining, something you can really enjoy yourself as the cook. I don't do a lot of brunch entertaining, but I do like it because it is early in the day, but that is also the drawback because it's early in the day. You don't have a lot of time to prep for it. However, you're kind of done with the everything and it's still the afternoon on Sunday and sometimes people hang around a long time. Sometimes they don't. And it's certainly, they certainly understand if you have to leave. So that's always good. So I was thinking, does anyone have any good tips? I do like to uh, keep things as easy as I can. And I'm sure everyone does here too. And so like, I would never do pancakes or waffles or anything that requires last minute cooking. I, everyone yeah. made a face like, of course, <laughs> scratch that off your list. Pancakes never make those for brunch. Cook. <laughs> yeah, never, never. So does anyone, what are some go-to items? Actually, I, I would almost, I would argue against that because oh, okay. I, that pancakes and waffles are what I really love to bake. So if you had people over, though, you would stand yeah, in the kitchen absolutely. and make that? Okay. Absolutely. All right. and can't you, for waffles, let's say, can't you make them ahead and just reheat yep. yeah. them gently in the oven? I don't think they taste as good, yeah, though. Yeah, I, I agree with you that. You know, I know. You can do Same that. Same with but, pancakes. You know, you can actually, if you're going to do, like, pancakes or waffles, you can set it up as, like, a pancake and waffle bar and have your toppings and... Well, that's a great sure. idea. But then and you still have to stand over the stove and make them. And that's you okay. you got to have a kitchen that people like to hang out in, which I well, don't have. <laughs> Well, and also, you know, people can can get their food and and take off. You can chat with people if they want to hang out. I mean, the the whole thing for me about brunch is that it's like super casual and, you know, just let it happen as it's happening. Yeah, that's true. That's true. So I always do like, especially for a crowd, do the bacon in the oven Mm -hmm. too, right? Because you don't want to be doing that on the stove top. And then your house sort of smells like bacon on top of it all. Very few people will complain about that. <laughs> that's true. It's sort of like your house smelling like garlic. Uh, it's, it's a good smell. So that's always a good tip. 
How about My you? favorite thing to do is a strata because you can assemble it all the night before mm-hmm. and just let it soak overnight and you pop it in the oven. And I mean, and it's so adaptable. Like you can pretty much put in anything that's in season. You know, in the spring, I like to do asparagus and um, leeks and what else? Maybe a little ham. Um, Frittatas have that same advantage. Exactly. That you can do them mm-hmm. in advance. Yeah. Got to have that. You have to have eggs, yeah. right? Yes. You have to have some sort of egg dish. So. Some mm-hmm. sort of egg or casserole dish. I've been making a uh, enchilada casserole, which oh, is well, really that's nice. nice for brunch. Yeah, yeah. A little green pepper, but kind of on the mild side. Well, yeah, that's you know, the best thing about brunch. You can. It exactly. doesn't need to be just breakfast food. Right. And you know, another thing I love to make is a fresh fruit, slightly macerated, not too much sugar, just toss it and, you know, nicely... Sliced fresh fruit always is a hit, it seems, you know? Yeah, and that's, I agree. Especially like in the spring because there's not a ton of fruit in season right. yet, but everybody wants that fruit, you know? And so like adding a little liqueur or a little marmalade or something to sort of help mm-hmm. bring out the sweetness. Yeah, really and nice. that's, you know, you don't need too much of that. And yeah. everyone seems to be happy with it. So it's it's a, a nice way of getting a little there's, freshness um, in your diet. Yes, there's a really great recipe that we have that one of our former food editor Shelley Weissman developed. It was um, mm. blueberries. I remember that. Was it tequila? Oh, in it? Blueberries, that, mango, and kiwi. So with tequila. delicious. With tequila. Yes. That is still one of my favorites. That's really a, delicious. That's a good way yeah. to um, kind of disguise some fruit that might not be <laughs> <laughs> up to par. Um, how about baking some stuff like um, muffins? I was thinking also savory muffins are also a good idea. Mm. You could do a ham and cheddar. Yep. Um, uh, coffee cakes are great. Coffee cakes are always a good thing to do. I would do that ginger muffin I just spoke about. Well, right? That would be a yeah. terrific one yeah. to include with um, some different jams nice. maybe. Oh, and coffee really cakes nice. can take some very different shapes mm-hmm. too. I mean, you could do a traditional square. You could do something round. You could do a, a bunt cake and have it be a coffee cake. Mm. Mm-hmm. And that's stuff you can do in advance. It's also a great way if you have fruit that's maybe not perfect, mm-hmm. you can hide it in a cake and <laughs> there's still a nice little burst of, of sweet fruit flavor in there and and that's good too. And how about scones? Those are always a good thing to have too. You can make those ahead kind of. I mean, I, what I do you think? I think you couldn't just reheat them gently in the oven before you serve them just to restore that nice crisp exterior. Mm -hmm. And since it is a brunch, I say try to be nice to yourself and make one thing that you promise yourself that you're going to buy outside and bring in, like a croissant or something like that, so you don't have to go crazy completely, you know? So you have a little time to just sort of enjoy yourself and you're not running around trying to plan so much. Mm -hmm. I'm I'm all for uh, curating Mm -hmm. uh, items as well. I mean, the whole idea is right because you kind of want to enjoy yourself as well. You don't want to be tied to your stove, although Chris doesn't mind that. So we should go to his house for brunch. <laughs> <laughs> the best thing also are the cocktails. One thing you could do is set up a Bloody Mary bar, which I think people enjoy. There's so many creative things you can do with Bloody Marys mm-hmm. now with with the garnishes. Oh, know. absolutely. Sometimes it's just it's too much. I've seen some that are just completely out of hand where there's so many garnishes in and si- sitting on top of and in on top of and you know balancing on top of each other and it's just uh, yeah. crazy. Yeah, it, there's a lot of Instagramable photos mm-hmm. of It's like a whole meal in a right, it's like, like, like Mary. gazpacho. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but one of the great things um which would be also a good thing to serve at a brunch would be the candied bacon that you find sometimes. Oh, that's and, uh, so um, nice. We have must we must have a candied bacon we have article. A few. We have a recipe, few right? really nice. They're simple, you know, a little brown sugar on top of the bacon and put it on a and rack that's kind in of the it, oven, right? and that's really it. Yeah. You just kind of wait for it I to get fabulous. Skip the Bloody Mary and just do I the bacon. Know. <laughs> well, you know, I've seen Bloody Marys with pieces of bacon oh, yeah, in them too, which is wow. It's like a meal in a cocktail. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, always the uh, cornichon and olives <laughs> and celery. Well, I mean, you can set out a pretty nice little spread of items for that, right? And what else can you put into it? Like shrimp? Oh, yeah. Mm. That lends itself. Right? Mm-hmm. That is like a meal. Um, cocktail onions. Oh, how about beef jerky? I've seen those. I've seen some with beef jerky. So wow. you're a fan of the Instagrammable. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's amazing what people you don't do. Have a problem with loading it up. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't put them all, everything I just said into it. But I, and I don't even know if I would go with the jerky myself. But I, the candy bacon definitely. Oh, that sounds some, great. Sometimes you look at those the Instagram photos and you think, how do I consume that? Uh, right. <laughs> 
Yeah, exactly. Or um, there, then you can also make them with clam juice, mm-hmm. and then you can do like clam shooters that that I've seen. Right, um, adding beer uh, for like a little carbonated kick, perhaps, or even club soda, or club yeah. soda. Yes, club soda. Yeah, and don't forget the uh, champagne. Yeah, can't so forget the mimosas. The, the, the right. classic mimosa. <laughs> See, I'm not a fan of Bloody Marys because I don't really like tomato juice. So mm-hmm. that's we always go the like Bellini. Yeah, mimosa. so tell me, that. tell me what else you like to have then. Aperol spritz. I, I <laughs> oh. know. It's, all right, now we're kind of tilting over to you know, but it's still a light drink, isn't it? Oh, I, I, it's absolutely a light yeah, drink. Okay, good. <laughs> it's meant to be enjoyed before you eat dinner. Absolutely. So I think that's a great idea. You could put raspberries in that. Mm, that's That'd fine. be nice. Mm-hmm. How about Bellinis? Um, yeah, there are, again, it's it's the thing where everybody wants that fruit that's not quite in season. But, I mean, if you, you can get your hands on frozen peach puree that is really good and does the job well. You know, I wonder if you couldn't serve sangria for a brunch. Oh, you certainly not? could. There oh, are no right. rules. A mm-hmm. nice white sangria I was just thinking white. Mm-hmm. would be really, really nice at brunch. We've got a nice sangria, too, Uh in our collection. Both. Oh, yeah. Yes, and like Jeff. many ways to customize it. Yeah. Jeffrey yep. Morgenthaler. It's a, right. an amazing sangria. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I like that idea. Especially like for on Easter. Yep. Uh, brunch, again, maybe, right? You know, nice fresh citrus juice in there. And again, if your fruit isn't necessarily perfect. Yeah, doesn't really it, matter. It doesn't really get matter. <laughs> consumed Although Jeffrey by, might disagree with that. <laughs> <we'll get> consumed <laughs> by the alcohol. <laughs> Um, and then how about the coffee? Uh, I was at a brunch recently and, uh, the host just brought in coffee. She went out and got a box of coffee from, um, you know, a local coffee place. And I thought that's, that was actually a good idea. You know, there's so many good little coffee shops and everyone pretty much sells it in a box now to go. It's an interesting thing where you mentioned curating your brunch, but to be able to promote or or take advantage of a local artisan in some way, whether Mm -hmm. it's getting your coffee or croissants mm-hmm. or maybe a nice loaf of bread. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is a great idea for coffee because otherwise, yeah. I mean, I, we certainly don't have any sort of massive Pot. coffee urn or, right, or even if we did, it's like you're having to brew it over and over again on your home-sized coffee maker. Yeah. So like and if you're forget, having more you can't than, use a Keurig type of thing. You'd be there, <laughs> no. You would be there all day. Like making waffles and coffee <laughs> right, and exactly. pancakes all day long. <laughs> yeah, I thought that was a terrific idea, especially when, when you have a large crowd and then they give you all the... Uh, you know, the cream and the sugar and everything to go with it. So that's one less thing to worry about for sure when you're entertaining. You do want to kind of keep everything to a minimum. Would you consider doing a cheese platter for a brunch? Mm-hmm. Why not? I think that would be really nice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, especially around Easter, I mean, my the my brunches are always buffet style and I always have, I mean, a ham with various accoutrements. So like that's kind of the centerpiece, you know, sure. carve a ham and... Um, have a couple of chutneys and mustards, and so like a cheese platter, I think is just it's a great way to sure. right, to fill that out. Um, mm-hmm. Add some biscuits, and people can kind of make their own sandwiches. I like oh, that idea. Biscuits, that's a good idea. Uh, smoked fish, mm-hmm. another way to go, right? Trout, yep. salmon. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And one thing that's really nice is just a poached salmon, not necessarily mm-hmm. cured. Like it's kind of you know it feels a little old fashioned, but I kind of love it because. I don't know. It's a. It, it just feels you a little know, different now. It's a little too. more neutral. Yeah, yeah. It's neutral and it's very fresh tasting. Right. You know, it's not that. It is old. Sa- that oily. used to be the big thing to do right. was to mm-hmm. poach a whole salmon. I, right. I poached one a couple years ago for a friend of mine's. I remember engagement that. party. Mm-hmm. I did it here in the test I kitchen <laughs> <laughs> because the salmon was really large, and I just I couldn't really handle it at home. So I remember we. Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, I do remember. And mm-hmm. I was remarking how um, I don't even think. Fine Cooking has a poached salmon recipe on our site. And um, I was thinking, it is a little old school to do a whole poached salmon. You know how you, like, cut out the right. cucumbers and mm-hmm. then you lay, like, like we, scales? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's I mean, that, very old school. That's very old school. <laughs> Did you do that? I have a memory of you doing that. I did that. I thought so. I was taking re- myself yeah. back to Martha Stewart uh, entertaining <laughs> book. I don't think we have a poach, but we've got, it might be roasted, but we do have that whole cool side of salmon, yes, a recipe for just something. just wasn't poached. And, and so, again, it's going back to the make ahead is that you can absolutely do that, whether you roast or poach it. Yeah. You can make it the night before. It was delicious. It's such a nice presentation, too. Yeah, yeah. it was. We've got a couple of sauces on the side, and you've got a, right. you've got a great thing. 
And then you have those boards, you know, that have the salmon head on the top. <laughs> salmon head, and then you put the the uh, side of mm-hmm. salmon in the middle of it, so it looks like a whole fish. <laughs> and kids will eat it too, I find, that they're not really fussy about that because it's not really overwhelming. It's a nice, mild flavor. And exactly. Unlike the smoked salmon, yeah, it's, it's exactly. a little more, yeah. Uh, so what else? Any other tips for our listeners so, that are thinking about doing a brunch? I have a fun idea. I've never actually tried this, but it's been like, it. I've had it torn out of a magazine. It was from Domino Magazine, and it predates Pinterest, so I've got the physical <laughs> uh, sheet. But it was a great idea, I thought, for doing Eggs Benedict for a crowd, mm-hmm. um, which is to cook the eggs in a silicone muffin dish, uh, mm. muffin tin. Mm-hmm. Um, and then so you have the eggs, top it with a um, slice of Canadian bacon, top it with a uh, English muffin half. And then because it's silicone, you can kind of pop out the eggs when they're cooked. So I love that idea. I've never had like a, you know, an eggs Benedict kind of crowd for brunch, but um, so the, so wait, so the English muffin just sits on the top and then you, yes, I can't remember if you bake it, toast you, it. You must have to toast you it might first, to- right? It, it might be that you, the eggs and the Canadian bacon go in the oven, and then you top it with a... And then when you flip it out. Exactly, yeah. Are you making a hollandaise with that, too? Yeah, and then you can mm-hmm. kind of just do like a simple hollandaise mm-hmm. or even a blender hollandaise. Yeah, that's nice. I love that And here's idea. my little tip. What's that? <laughs> Keeping your hollandaise warm. Uh, make it ahead and put it in a thermos. Mm. You know, a really good thermos. I, I, I've i done that before. That is a good idea. You know, I really it, it really, really works with uh, like a... Or blancs, even you mm-hmm. know something that you mm-hmm. kind of need to keep warm, but you don't want to make at the last minute, but you kind of have to because it's the only way it stays. And you don't want to let them break, right? Exactly. So I, f- I know this sounds goofy, but you know we're always looking for little tips and tricks in the test kitchen, and that's one that really, really works. Get yourself a really good thermos and well insulated, and it really, really keeps things warm. So that is yeah. a good idea. It is. Mm-hmm. It really is. Mm, I don't have enough thermoses, but <laughs> little ones would ha- would be great for Definitely. A, a sauce. Those Yetis are so fabulous. That, they are. That they brand keep everything is really, really good. Really warm. Yep. Well, we can talk about brunch ideas all day, but now let's take um, some time to answer some questions from our readers. This is a good one for people who like to shop at like the big box stores. I have a bad habit, and I don't know if it's bad. Maybe it's not a bad habit, but I have a bad (laughs) habit of buying too many croissants when I'm at a big box store like Costco or BJ's. Any ideas on what to do with them once they're a bit past their prime? Well, Diana, we, you, I'm sure you'd, you might have some oh, ideas. Yeah, just a couple. Mm-hmm. Uh, we hate to throw things out in the test kitchen. We're always looking to repurpose things. So I would say to let them dry out a little bit at room temperature. You could pulse them in a food processor to make breadcrumbs. Mm-hmm. That's a good um, idea. Aside from the typical uses for breadcrumbs, you can also use these special breadcrumbs to top gratins, bake pastas or meatloaf, or cut them into cubes and bake them off a little bit till they're golden and use them as croutons. Ooh, yum. Top salad. The buttery flavor is so great, yeah. and it's a, such a plus in any dish. Mm. We also have a recipe for croissant bread pudding. I was on just going to say bread pudding. Oh, <laughs> yum. That's Can't wow. That. Oh, that sounds decadent. Bread pudding is good for brunch, too. Sorry mm-hmm. about that. Yeah. But keep bringing that up. Oh, it would be. Yeah. yeah. A croissant bread pudding, oh my especially. God, especially. perfect. <laughs> okay. Uh, sticking with the bread theme for a minute, here's another question. I love serving warm, crusty rolls at my dinner parties all year round. Any ideas on how to keep them warm at the table? Okay. So I know this sounds a little funny, but it works. Find a smooth, flat rock that fits nicely into your bread basket and wash it, dry it really well, and warm it in a 250 oven for about 15 minutes. And then put it at the bottom of your bread basket under the cloth towel, and your bread will stay warm for a very long time. Okay, that is a great tip. I wonder if you could also use like peb, um, not pebbles, like sort of those vase filler stones that you can buy, the little rounded ones. You High know? weights. Pie oh, weights. weights, yes. <laughs> you don't have to go digging in the woods then. That's right. Nope. <laughs> I love the pie weights. That's fabulous. That is. Do great. they hold their heat for a long? Oh yeah, they do. Oh, oh. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's great. Found that when trying to put them back in their jar. Yeah. <laughs> I know, those are so hot. <laughs> but yeah, I have um, like I think they're kind of a clay or ceramic type pie weight. And that they do hold perfect. their heat for quite a while. Yeah. But that would be a great uh, alternative use. Absolutely. I know because, yeah. I mean, you know, they're not a lot of alternative uses for pie weights. No, they're not. No, like, but that is rolling, perfect. Except for rolling on the floor and getting underneath things. <laughs> so you have under to find the them. Stove. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay, well, that's a great idea. Keep your dinner rolls warm the whole time you're eating dinner. That sounds like a, a great tip. So next question. My bun cakes always stick to the inside of the pan. Do you have any tips for preventing this? Well, believe it or not, that's happened a few times in the test kitchen. And uh, one way around it is to, um, if you're using melted butter, to take a pastry brush and brush the inside of your pan. And the, the pastry, pastry brush will get into the all, all the little crevices in the pan um, or... Even with cooking spray, you want to spray the pan if that's what you're using and then take the pastry pastry brush to make sure it's actually in all those little crevices. So the cake should turn out pretty clean. And you wouldn't flour it, right? You could flour. You know, we did use the turbinado sugar on one of the bun cakes mm-hmm. we that helped, did right? recently. You know, it just gives the exterior a crunchy, nice crunchy mouthfeel and a little bit more texture. Um it did help, uh, but honestly, I think the key is truly making sure that all those little nooks and crannies in the bunt cake pan are really, really well coated with some sort of um, melted Grease fat or butter. Or base. Right. Yeah. And I guess whether or not to use flour just depends on the recipe. It like depends on the recipe. You for know, for chocolate, you wouldn't I think want a lot, to. Right, I think a lot. Of, oh, well, you could put cocoa. cocoa right, right, exactly. Yeah. I think a lot of people are also a little afraid of using the sugar, but I know we tried that and it was really, really nice. Uh, toasted nuts are is good. Toasted uh, nuts breadcrumbs too. also works mm-hmm. as a coating. Mm-hmm. I think one thing I would add is to make sure that you get the cake out of the pan while it's still warm. Exactly. Don't you let know, it cool too much. That's the thing, too. You know, when you're constantly working with this um, and it's part of your your, your job, uh, you kind of depend on your colleagues to throw things like that in because you kind of forget that, yeah, it's just a natural thing to get it out of the pan while it's still slightly warm. I actually reset the timer when I, when the, I take a cake out of the oven. I set not the timer for idea. like 10 minutes mm-hmm. so yeah. I know... That, yeah, that's the that's, that's a great my, idea. I live my life by the timer. I yeah. take my timer everywhere with me in the test kitchen. It's it's always by my side. I'm always my life is with the timer. It's crazy. The other thing I would add about the greasing step is to make sure you're doing the central tube because yes. I oh, so, yes. so many times I focus on all those nicks and crannies and then I forget right, to do the, the central tube. part. And exactly. That's important. All the way up to the the edges, up to the top mm-hmm. of everything because don't forget the cake is going to rise. So you gotta cover that top part too. I, I don't necessarily want to like espouse a particular brand, but there are baking sprays with flour yeah, that also are. work really, really well. I've used well. them. I really That's like great. that. I really mm-hmm. like them. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're not so... Well, they adhere better. They um, adhere better, yeah. and they don't leave a film like coating the inside of a pan with flour mm-hmm. does. And additionally, with that, you can also sprinkle like turbinado or nice. nuts or breadcrumbs, mm-hmm. and you'll still get that texture and, That's really and a nice. quick release from mm-hmm. the pan. Okay, well, thanks for all those tips. That's our show for this week. Thanks for listening. Join us again on our next podcast. For some of the recipes discussed on the show, visit our website, finecooking.com. Also, be sure to join our Fine Cooking podcast group on Facebook and follow us on Instagram. 